Oh, thanks, um, Will, and welcome, welcome to ShedX, and welcome to my garden shed. Thank you, Marcus. It's it's fabulous to to almost feel I'm there. I can't quite smell it, but but I get a real sense of presence in your shed. Old deck chairs in here. You know what this smells like. It's that kind of shed. And I've been working here since, well, for the last eight weeks, but it's been really brilliant. And thank you so much for sending that thing through. It's great. Um, and the talk, so just we get, before we just introduce the talk, it's just really a bit of a, I suppose it's a bit of a, a thing back to, I think it was 2008 was the very first shift happens. I think we met when you came up to York. Was that, was that in your diary? 2008, 2009, something like that? Yeah, yeah. It, it, that's a while back, isn't it? I remember it very well. It was an important time. I, I think that it was one of those points where we had started to realise like it was painfully obvious that the internet was not going to deliver the change we wanted to see unless we made it happen. The, the, the technologies and the technology companies and the governments and, and everyone around were not going to deliver the good outcomes that we knew the technology had embedded within it unless we actually took some action. Uh, and what you did with, with Shift Happens was just to bring together a bunch of people who understood it well enough and cared enough about it to try to start to engage in that dialogue, in that conversation. And it's been continuing ever since. Well, that's right. I mean, we did sort of five Shift Happens all in all and a, and a TEDx as well. Um, and I think it's what I've always been interested, in, particularly as a sort of, you know, as a, as a theatre maker and artist, but also with a science background. So always, always this stuff has really fascinated and intrigued me. And that kind of crossing over of those worlds has always been part of, I suppose, of my practice and sort of yours as well, too, really, with your present, presenting and as well as your background. That's right. Yes. Um, I, I sort of have always been a computer scientist and a practitioner. Um, as in that's how I've earned my living doing computery things as well as a journalist and a commentator and also heavily involved with arts and cultural organizations particularly as they started to grapple with the implications of the emergence of the network as like, a technology that binds us all together but also creates a whole set of problems so yes um, like you I don't respect those boundaries I don't think they're useful boundaries to, to take account of I think that the real change comes from being able to see the commonalities and be able to act with some assurance in all of those areas. So you do need to nod. You can't just randomly bounce into a technical area and say, yes, I understand Python programming or how to configure Docker and, and try and get away with it. And similarly in the arts, you need to have had sort of lived experience. You need to have a, um, engaged, I suppose, in the past. But if you have done that across a number of disciplines, then I think it brings a, a whole new perspective what's going on at the moment exactly and it's interesting actually because the kind of the genesis of some of this sort of project is that we did shift happens i say for five years uh, and then a tedx now a shedx but also then the arts council around what was called no boundaries you just mentioned the no boundaries thing there so no boundaries was something which we then co-curated with them again bringing some of that element of i suppose it is that sort of ted style which was something that always interested me having been there since 2007 was it was those really interesting you know juxtaposition of talks and conversations by people that would abut against each other which on the outside seemingly didn't have any connection but when you saw them together it was really potent and that for me is what I want to do with this project to so put some people together who've just got interesting things to say and that's really the basis of this thing so I'm really delighted that you're able to come and um, you know do this talk so in terms of your talk do you want to introduce your first Shedex talk because obviously then we're going to go to that and um, do you want to introduce yeah, it for us? Sure. Um, so this came out of um, lots of conversations. So, so um, I work at the BBC, BBC Research and Development, and, and spend a lot of time thinking about the implications of, of the internet um, on our society yeah. worldwide and, and how it's changing the world and how we could change it. I've always believed that, you know, we designed this stuff, we can shift it, we can, re we can redesign it to, to serve um, socially good outcomes, uh, to do things we want it to do. And in the midst of um, what's happening with COVID-19 and the pandemic, and certainly here in the UK, uh, the inability to go into the office and, and, and the shift in society and the impact around the rest of the world, I realized that we are relying, as we are now, um, on the very technologies that got us into this trouble in the first place. That is that the advanced technologies that come from late stage industrial capitalism um, are part of the problem because 
designing and creating, building them, the materials that are extracted from the earth in order to construct them, the supply chains that make them possible, the ways of working and living that they support, all of those things created the circumstances within which this pandemic could happen. And so if we're going to look for a time afterwards, it might be dangerous to assume that these technologies will be the solution. I don't know what the solution is, but you know, the nice thing about those shift happens, and indeed most of your work is, you're not looking for glib answers. You're not looking for 10 minutes and that's that problem solved, you can move on now. You're looking for difficult questions that, that force people to confront difficult realities. So that's what I was trying to do in my essay, which I recorded for you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Bill Thompson. It's usually dangerous to draw analogies between computing and any other field except possibly mathematics, because the way we do things in computing is so bounded by technical constraints, business models and naive modelling assumptions that trying to apply our approach in other domains is either laughably simplistic or clearly unhelpful. However, as I reflect on the state of the world as the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic continues to disrupt so much about the lives of so many, it seems that one idea from our profession offers a useful way of thinking about what we're going through. That idea is technical debt. The cumulative impact of taking the easy way to delivering a solution instead of doing it properly, that will one day be repaid either by redoing the work as bug reports come through, or through lost data, lost effort, and lost trust in the software. Technical debt is accrued for many reasons. Sometimes it's just foolishness. I remember debugging some code that I'd written when I was a full-time programmer and finding a function that was to be called only rarely and seemed to be failing. When I looked at the source code, there was an empty function with a comment, must finish this before release date. To my chagrin, I realised I'd written that some months before. Technical debt is also accumulated when projects are badly planned or under-resourced or simply badly executed. Or it may be because of unreasonable optimism on behalf of the developers who assume that things will be okay, or that certain edge conditions will never be met, or that users simply couldn't be that foolish. But whatever the reason, the end result is code that gets shipped even though it is not good enough. When product teams talk about refactoring, they often mean sorting out a load of stuff that should have been done right the first time, but wasn't, because we made the decision to do it the faster, easier way. You can pay down technical debt by doing the work, though sometimes we try to clear it by declaring bankruptcy and moving on, as Apple did when they built macOS 10 on the next step code base and simply threw out version 9. Of course, even this new software has its compromises, unknown errors and unexpected interactions, we just hope that the level of debt is lower so that it buys us some time. As for code, so for cultures. But in this case, the nature of the debt is different and it has much more severe consequences. For the last hundred years or so, we have been building up an unsustainable level of ecological debt by failing to address the consequences of extractive capitalism and its effect on the natural world. We've developed systems that rely not on solving problems, but on externalising all the negative aspects of their implementation, from the poor health and poverty of employees, to the proper disposal of waste, to the construction of financial systems of unsustainable complexity whose collapse is inevitable. We've acted as if finite resources are infinite, that fragile supply chains are immune to disruption, and that there will be a ready supply of people to be exploited and governments to offer incentives for acting in ways that do not safeguard the environment. We've disregarded the complex interdependencies of the many life forms on our planet, inserted ourselves into every possible niche, destroyed habitats in search of short-term gain, and forced humans into close proximity to many other species and their associated diseases, symbionts and parasites. And we've tried to ignore the consequences until now. When a virus has crossed species and found that we are both biologically and epidemiologically vulnerable, we catch it and we spread it, and it's not quite fatal enough to die out naturally. SARS-CoV-2 
and the COVID-19 diseases it causes may be the form of the destructor, but we opened the portal a long time ago. The Industrial Revolution, modern capitalism, neoliberalism and globalisation created the conditions in which it became likely that the disease would cross the species barrier, that it would spread rapidly through crowded cities following paths of trade and tourism, and that the supply chains of the materials needed to deal with the emerging health crisis, the PPE and ventilators in this case, would be disrupted just as demand for them increased. Some countries seem to have managed the pandemic effectively, and it looks like enough has been learned that will be out of the current critical period within a few months. If that is the case, then we need to decide what we want to happen afterwards. Not after things go back to normal, because the idea of normal was unsustainable and has finally broken, but after the current crisis, when we develop treatments and perhaps even a vaccine. Those who have power and money in the old system will, of course, want things to be as similar as possible to the way they were, as it benefited them so much. They will try to persuade us that restoring the world that led directly to the current horror is the only real option, and that with relatively minor tweaks, we can make the risk manageable. They'll invite us to be nostalgic for a world where a tiny proportion of individuals have unimaginable wealth, where a few large companies dominate both markets and the shape of political possibilities, and where the vast majority of people lack resources beyond what they can earn each day, and where for many, that amount is barely enough to feed them. A world where systems are designed to oppress and entertain, but not to liberate, share power or delight. They'll want us to add COVID to flu and malaria, as things that are just part of the natural world, and they'll ask us to believe that the risk of catching and dying from it is worth having our cars and cafes and concerts and open plan offices back. After all, we seem comfortable with around 1.4 million people dying each year in road traffic accidents and 1.5 million from TB, so there's clearly a threshold effect here. If we're to resist the efforts to snap things back to the world as it was, but with more space between tables in the restaurants and even harsher controls on people's ability to escape oppression and seek refuge in other countries, then we need to have an idea of what an alternative might look like. After all, we seem to be having the revolution many were asking for, the one where the old order was overturned. Now we need to decide what we want to do with it. One problem is that most of our dreams so far involve the use of technologies that are the expression, in silicon and glass, of the very system that has accrued the ecological debt we're now repaying. Like hippies in 1960s San Francisco, who may have managed to turn on and tune in, but only ever managed to drop in to the welcoming arms of the consumerist world that provided their drugs, clothes and cars. Too many of our dreams of a new normal assume that we can have all the tech without the extractive capitalism. Even the great pause itself, this shutting down of so much of the industrialised world, has been made possible by technologies that are the product of the unrestrained operation of the systems that made it necessary. Many of us are relying on these technologies to get through this hard time, either working or staying in touch with family and friends or being entertained as we stay home and try to stay safe. So it's hard to see how we could do without laptops and tablets and phones and the network. Perhaps the answer lies in reframing the goal. The point of capitalism is not to satisfy desires, but to allow the accumulation and deployment of wealth. And the fact that we want or rely on the products of the factories or offices is a necessary precursor of that end, but not the end in itself. In pursuit of that end, politicians have placed free markets at the centre of their ideology and constructed social policy around the primacy of those markets. But what responses to COVID-19 around the world have shown is that the market is not primary and that only a strong, well-ordered state can preserve the basic infrastructure that makes the market possible. It's like the point where people realise that Newtonian physics could be completely explained by relativity, but not vice versa. There's something beneath the economy, and that thing is the expression of the social bonds between us. 
which manifests itself first as society and only secondarily in the market. If we use the current crisis to embed an understanding that the market is not the central force of human society, perhaps we can create the conditions for humane markets that respect the conditions of the natural world and set our ambitions accordingly. We don't need to forget what we already know, but we can start to use that knowledge and our technical understanding to build a world that values humans and other species, that acknowledges our interconnectedness and that's not driven by consumption or profit or accumulation. In that world, we might still manage to have the network and the good that comes from it without burdening ourselves with debts that no honest society could pay. Well, that was really great. Thank you so much indeed, uh, Bill, for, for not only giving your time, but also giving your wisdom and experience, which is always a joy to listen to and hear to. So thank you very much. And I'm really glad to say that you've been the first ShedX talk. Um, I don't know how many we're going to do of these. We're going to do a number. If anyone else is interested, please let me know. So thank you, Bill Thompson. How was it for you? It, it, was, it was profound. I, I really felt the love from the audience. Um, so I, I must say this. So, so a lot of my colleagues and, and friends say they find it difficult working with video conferencing systems like that because they have no sense of who are, who's there, who's on the other end, particularly if they're doing something like a seminar or a lecture as, as I just did. Um, fortunately, I've been a radio journalist for 30 years, so I'm actually perfectly comfortable speaking into a piece of plastic with no sense or well, with, with no knowledge of what's on the other side, but a real sense of who is on the other side. And that, that pra radio is great practice for this world because you are always speaking into what seems to be a void, but is actually filled with people who are listening, who care, who are thoughtful, who are attentive. And, and good radio is when you're speaking to each one of them individually, not to the crowd. And it is a very different experience from having an audience, you know, in, in York in the days of Shift Happens, you know, there was a bunch of people there and you could watch them moving, you could see them sort of restless, you could occasionally hear them heckling because uh, it was a dramatic audience. Um, you don't get any of that with this experience. So it's a different skill set, but it's one I actually feel quite comfortable with. So I hope it went down well for everyone. No, thank you, Bill. And also this is a little bit like we're sort of making podcasts with pictures, if you like. That's sort of another thing here. It's audio- I would never catch on. What would you call it? What would we call it? I don't know. Television. Anyway, listen, thanks ever so much for your time, Bill. It's always good spending time with you. And next time I see you, I hope we're having a, a beer or at least a coffee somewhere together. Okay, thanks a lot, Bill. Take care. Bye, Marcus. Okay.